to a very special guest who um, will add a lot of depth to the segment Awakened. Now what? David, hello. Hi there, Olga. So grateful to be here. Yes, yes. I have so much gratitude for your uh, very quick response and conversation with you yesterday. It was really sweet, sweet, sweet and wonderful. And the reason I invited David is because I would like to explore today from standpoint of those on mystical path or those who derive to the state that many consider to be state of mystical uh, existence to explore a little bit about the path itself and what many can assume waiting for them at the end of the path even though the idea of the path obviously it's just perception right there is no path as is is it David no there's no path it's, it's really just an experience yeah yes yes would you like to share a little bit where you are right now what what took you to where you are right now and how do you experience the state in which you're in well, it's a little bit like sometimes there's Hollywood movies that come out that I can really relate to. And there's one that came out with Scarlett Johansson recently called Lucy, mm -hmm. where Lucy starts to use more and more percentages of her brain um, and higher and higher and higher working. Uh, basically, it's kind of a, seems to be a drug induced uh, state. But actually, regardless of the pathway, the, the ultimate goal is always to live our full potential. To, to live the, the love and the peace and the joy and the happiness that we were created as, that we are created to be like our source. So uh, I see it really as kind of a journey and how willing am I to trust God or source or the universe? How willing am I to trust source for everything, to make no decisions, big or small, by myself, but just let the source give it to me moment by moment by moment. And I find that it's it started off as kind of like an experiment and a curiosity. And then, uh, like yourself, Olga, I had some very, I had a big experience that seemed to change my perspective of everything and everyone. And, and yet, that was just the beginning. It wasn't an endpoint. It wasn't something where I, I just announced, "Okay, I've arrived." It was it was the beginning of an ever opening journey of how trusting can I be with my intuition? How trusting could, to let go of analysis and mm -hmm. critical kind of thinking and evaluating and and just to trust my intuition. That's that's really what it came down to for me. Would you like to share about your experience? or gradual experiences that led you to, uh, a lot of people refer to that as awakening, what people refer to that as path to enlightenment. Let, let's just say that the opening, the opening and shift of, uh, I, that's how I see that it's simply shift of perception because the state, there's nothing changes, right? The, the, the individual is still appear to be the same. It's still the word, it's still the actions, but the center of perception moves from over here, I'm perceived to be myself as Olga or as David, to I'm a unified consciousness, let's put it this words. In, in all, you know, the interesting things about words, they always fail, because the words are only pointers. They never can describe what it is, it only can describe what, is, what it's not, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so how did it happen to you? How, how it started happening and what the uh, yeah evolution is as well a tricky word to use here, but let's let's call it evolution of your state and your the depth of the experience itself. Yeah, I think if I had to go back to like what seemed to be even a starting point, it would be like coming beyond crisis or beyond hurt or grief, the the beyond the darkness and. There was an event that occurred back around, I think it was close to 1982 for me when my grandfather was diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. and I loved him very dearly and I, and I watched, I would go to the hospital and, and visit him and he went down very skinny, almost like a walking skeleton. He lost so much weight and, and so forth and it shook me 
up. Uh, I think a lot of times, whether it's a terminal illness for, for oneself or a loved one, it's like shakes you up. It's like it reminds you of, of this temporal world and, and the, all the questions that come around this temporary world because there's something inside of us that knows we're eternal beings and, and it takes like a shock to start to wake us up like a wake-up call. Mm. So I watched him go down and, and pass away and, and that really triggered me to kind of allow these questions into my consciousness of what's, what's it all for? What's the meaning of life? What am I doing anything for? What's the purpose? Mm. And then um, I had a series of expansive experiences where I felt just connected and one with the world, with the universe. There were synchronicities that showing me that everything was a reflection of my mind and there were signs and symbols everywhere. And I started to devote myself to what I called it like an inner calling. And then after about two and a half years of really deep devotion of study and reading and practice, then my intuition, my intuitive voice was very, very clear. I felt it was like Jesus uh, within me, uh, not Jesus the man or Jesus the historical figure, but, but just the presence of unconditional love, agape love within me, really my true inner voice. Let me interrupt you for a second. When you're referring to Jesus, does it come from your um, background to belong to Christian practice? Or because you teach Course of Miracle right now, and Course of Miracle is there is there is connection obviously to Christianity. Mm. How how so that you give it a, a name Jesus in this context? Yeah, I think it it just felt like this presence that I had known uh, very deeply, but it was like a universal presence to me. And so I can use a lot of different names interchangeably. Um, and the Course of Miracles used some psychological and educational and Christian terms. So the, those were just the words that came to me, Jesus or Holy Spirit. But it's really just like the universal self that we are, the universal spirit. That it's not tied to any particular culture or any particular religion. It's, it's just who we truly are. And it can take many forms. So that's the beautiful thing about it. There's not like one form that's better than another. It's really just what serves, uh, what what reaches you, mm -hmm. and what is most helpful. So it's I see it's very universal for me. It's not uh, tied into any particular religion or any particular theology. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was watching your videos, what attracted me to to have a conversation with you is your willingness to let go completely of the world. What I mean by that is that first, when first experience of awakening comes, uh, and I refer awakening as ability to perceive everything as is directly outside of the veils of perception, of the filters of personality that we adopt. Personality is my character as a person, and that and another. And then there is a choice, an experience happened, there is a still choice because the memory of the personality is still there, isn't it? So there's a choice to, do I stay on the cliff and hold on to the rock looking in the abyss or do I let it go and allow to lose control? Because people always say, oh, there is nobody in control. Well, there is and there is not, isn't it? It's everything, the world, as we say, dual world is, is exactly as is, dual and undual. There is someone in control and there is not simultaneously. There is a universal consciousness, the, the big mind, and there is individual consciousness that perceived to be an individual, a person, isn't it? But it's not one or another, they, perceive, they, they exist simultaneously. Different people went through different from my observation. Please share your experience. From my observation, as, as, I, as I read people sharing the experiences, or they, they, they share during talks, or so on and so forth, people go through iteration, stages of iteration. And that's how it happened uh, to me, too. I had very vivid and very long experience of complete unified consciousness, where there is absolutely 
there was no ego, there was no center of, center of perception, there was no I. The Olga vanished completely. It was very blurry memory that mm. was not any different than probably any other individual. Just a little bit felt like there is just increased volume practically, right? Mm. And on, on the level of, you know, 7 billion individuals and other life forms, many, 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 right? So there's that increased volume. But but there was no sense of ego, no wants, desires, pains. There was no sense of time. There was no sense of uh, separation of any kind whatsoever. There was very insightful, very profound experience. And then there was a collapse of experience where iteration happened, where memory of that experience remained, yet the center of perception almost like reintegrated itself. It was huh? Olga again. Olga with the memory of it, now Olga sees the world very differently. She never ever can go back to be Olga that was uh, blissfully arrogant. Ignorant, sorry. Mm -hmm. Ignorant. Yes. Olga that didn't know. Now Olga knows. And the reason why I started this particular segment, because I believe a lot of people more and more are coming through this experience, but then the question, now what? Now I cannot play the game in the same way I played it before because I was immersed in the game. I'm not immersed in this game any longer. I, I can still play the game because now I reintegrate it as a person and the individual mind. But now I know very clearly, vividly and undisputably that I'm not it. Yeah. That I perceive myself to be, but I'm not it any longer. Yeah. So how do you play the game of life? I, and I mean life is not life, capital L, which is there is no how in it, right? There is no how yeah. to play, it just happened, life happens, there is no, you, you, yeah. then you don't exist in it. But, but the game of the world in which reintegrated self of individual exists, there is monetary uh, obligation, there is obligations in the family and relationships, there is, there is all which, which constitute world that the mind created on level of individual entities. How did it happen to you? How how did it happen this this the willingness or the moment where you actually let go of the world? Because that's what you shared. You let go mm -hmm. of the world that was gradually or or, or at once. Please share that. Yeah it, for a while it seemed gradual because it seemed like this back and forth that you talk about, but then it came to a point where I could see it wasn't uh, gradual at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there could be no compromise in it, in the sense that the appearance would still be what the appearance looked like, and, and so it was an allowance with that. But with an egoless state, there's no sense of, of need or desire or wanting something and even those beliefs like we talked about obligations and duties and things that seem to be so much a part of the human condition uh, in that experience and in the trust of that then that was released as well in the sense that that the spirit can use the symbols of the world without a sense of need or duty or obligation because the stress can come in if we feel personally obligated then were identified with the personality self. And that personality self is, is part of the illusion. So for me, it was very important to, to be fully in this experience and fully trusting and then let the symbols be whatever the symbols would be uh, without any sense of control. And I like that you brought up uh, control there at the beginning because there's a sense of no control over the world. You're not trying to control people, and you're not even trying to control the body or control situations, but you're really in control in the ultimate sense of when you are in total responsibility for your state of mind. In other words, you have total control over your peace of mind. You have total control over happiness, of joy. It's, it's the state of mind that you're in control of in a good way because it's the spirit flowing through you and and the spirit is 
is has dominion over the world. Like Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He wasn't meaning dominating it in through force or uh, personal control, because he certainly didn't demonstrate that at all. But he had control over the elements, and and he seemed to be able to perform miracles, and he was not at the mercy of of the the laws of physics, even of the laws of the world. He had he had transcended all of those. So for me. I went so deeply into this experience that on three different occasions, the world just disappeared. And it was just all love and light and oneness and I knew everything and there was nothing else and mm -hmm. so forth. And then what would seem to be back to perceiving a world, it was to not hold on to any self-concepts. For example, even with relationships and, and partnerships, there's some concepts involved. One person and another person relating, or family self-concepts, or you could have concepts around a career, um, or just even a job, let's say not even a career, but just a job or a task. If you become identified with that task or with that job, and you think that's who you are, then that's just another self-concept. And the point is to not freeze in any concepts, you know, to, to be t totally free, like a free spirit, allowed to use the concepts and use the symbols and the images, but without identifying with them. So mm. to me, that's the key. That's mm. what, what it's all about. So tell me, do you find that there is ego in you or is it dissolved? What degree of uh, absence of this iteration happens in your world right now? Well, I find my state of mind is very, very consistent. And so if we talked about ego involvement or even percentage, there would be um, strain or stress or discomfort or even fatigue. You know, those kind of things are all associated with the sense of ego. So I find it's a very vibrant experience for me. It's a very consistent experience. And some of the people that have come to move to live near me or around me, uh, the reason that they came in the first place is they heard some line about, um, oh, David hasn't had a bad day for 20, 20 years or 20 some years. And they just were curious. They said, well, I'd like to see Let's that. Let's test you. <laughs> yeah, let's let's test him, or let's let's come and I want to go live with him. I don't want to just see see a talk or a presentation. I want to spend time in the presence of that, and and I want to if it's really true, if it's if there's a lightheartedness and a non-judgment and a, a a loving acceptance and a joy, then let me see it. Uh, let me experience that. So that's really what people have come not so much to learn from me, um, but to just be in the experience of happiness. You know, what we all want to experience happiness. And we don't want struggle. We just don't want struggle. We don't we know it's not natural. Right. And let me ask you this. Since since we are talking about struggle and joy and so on and so forth. From my experience, the memory of it now, when Olga disappeared, perceiver disappeared completely to the degree that there was nobody was discriminating the state or experience. So it was completely irrelevant whether there is joy or, or pain because neither of it would find place in the space I was in because there was not I who would be experiencing any of it. And that's what I find a little bit challenging when people share that uh, the enlightenment is a bliss and it's joy and it's love because it doesn't seem possible when there is no ego then who is experiencing joy? Who is wanting happiness? Who is dealing with uh, any discrimination of struggle or suffering or pain? There is no I to perceive the world with discrimination, isn't it true? Yeah, I would say there's no I that has anything to do with duality. So if we talked about pleasure and pain or 
Um, anything that has an opposite, um, that's still part of the ego because the ego is is an, a world of opposites. Uh, it's a it's a belief in opposites. So when I talk about joy, I'm not talking about like joy the way humans think of it, like joyful at the birth of a new baby or joyful because they got the job that they always wanted, that they worked at for years, or joyful about getting married. Or some people tell me they, they're joyful when they finally get divorced. <laughs> they wish they'd done it earlier, you know, they said. But see, that's like a joy based on an outcome, yeah. based on, on a, a, a discrimination, a perception of something in the world. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something, like you said, that's so transcendent that there is no individual I, but there's presence. And you might say that I sometimes call it I am presence. It's still, it's the I amness, but it's not a personality. There's no person that can claim it because it's, it can't be claimed by, by the ego. And, and egos, uh, you know, personality, the Latin word for, for per, persona is mask. And, you know, that's what the human conditions, we were talking about 7 billion mask is really what it is. And this experience is beyond the mask, completely beyond the mask. Absolutely, absolutely. And it seems like possibility to, to have both dual experience simultaneously, because non-duality is, is a combination of opposites, really. It's not either or. People assume, oh, if, if, if there is a state, non-dual state, then there is only that. No, the whole point, how mind designed, somehow in the, the mystical way designed the world, and the world appears as it is, because there are opposites. In order for experiencer to experience joy, there must be pain to compare it with. Isn't well, it true? I, no, I actually, I mean, I, I find that what pure non-dualism is, is just this, we call it unified consciousness or unified awareness, and it literally, it doesn't even relate to the opposites at all. It, in it other words... It doesn't see opposites from, from memory. Yes. It doesn't speak. It doesn't see opposites as opposites. It just everything as is. It doesn't discriminate. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it useful? Is it not useful? Yeah. Is, it, is it meaningful or pointless? Is it um, painful or joyful? It doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. But when yeah. iterations happen, and for majority of people, when awakening ex was experienced as a state, yeah. insights were downloaded, let's put it that way, but then there is iteration. Here I am in a state of unified consciousness for a moment, and the next moment I'm fully immersed in the human experience, and the only thing that changed since awakened experience happened is the witness, the observer that before did not exist. Before, there was complete immersion in the world, and the world felt so tangible and real, and that's what it is. And I is I. I am Olga. I'm Olga, and I have to put makeup when I go on camera, right, for example. <laughs> yeah. But now Olga plays with that. Olga knows that it all doesn't matter, but it's equally matters because the game is the game, so might as well put makeup. And some people, I know in some people, it's I'm so funny, some people say, oh, uh, why someone would, would th think about the look if they uh, awaken? <laughs> it's the game. It's the game. It's like we sleep. We could sleep on the floor, and we can sleep in a beautiful bed. We can. It's a game, isn't it? Yeah, I think the, the, the thing about it is, is when we go back and forth, then we're you might say in the process of forgiveness, because what we want is is stability. We want unification and and the I would say the happy game of forgiveness I call it is when we don't judge not because we shouldn't judge but in the state of joy and peace uh, of bliss you know there's nothing to judge we we can't even conceive of a judgment so in that sense you know I feel like this is where I talk a lot about guidance and intuition mm -hmm. if your guidance is to dress up or wear earrings or makeup, you know, that's your guidance. And that's the key to coming into being as consistent uh, state of happiness, I think, is following your guidance. It's not trying to analyze things or break things apart. You know, when people talk to me about um, 
food and which foods are helpful and which foods are harmful. I'd say it's, it's thoughts, it's, con it's consciousness. You know, you, if you're in the flow and you're flowing with that, you, you are not concerned about what you put in your mouth. It's just all part of that flow. It's the same with uh, dressing up. I mean, uh, probably like you, I have uh, a closet over here and, and a wardrobe and I splash out and go all around the world to all these 38 countries and I'll just put stuff on and take stuff that just is in the flow. I don't try to uh, wear certain clothes or have a certain structure or a certain plan. It's all spontaneous for me. In fact, when I was in uh, Australia one time, a friend of mine was traveling with me on all these gatherings I was doing, and she would notice that every gathering that we would do, I matched with the background. And so she would, in the morning, she would wait for me to get dressed first, because she <laughs> wanted to match too. So she would just watch and wait until I got dressed, and then she would go get dressed, and then she was matching too. Now, I wasn't trying to do that consciously. I mean, I, I didn't even know the places or whatever, but it, I, this is like the divine joy, the divine play, where yeah. we can be happy and joyful, but we don't need to try to make a structure out of it or, or tell people they need to, you know, act a certain way or be a certain way or dress a certain way. Right, right, right. And here is an interesting, uh, you, you, you touched upon it, it's an interesting, for me at least, conversation altogether about control, control over life when personality is active, the, the iteration happened towards individual mind, right? Yes. The, and this is, I find it very interesting paradox. There is no control, yet there is control. There is no free will, per se, and there is free will. It's, it's depending where you iterate in the state. So when, when unified consciousness is perceiving the world from not center, now there is free will because there is no separate, uh, should I say, separate entities to impose the willpower on me, on you, on object. There is no subject and object. Is yeah. it's all non-objective. So, so then there is no free will. It's just this flow, and the time does not exist. It's a, it's a lapse. It's a, there's the, everything is linear and simultaneous. Yet, when the mind imagine itself for a moment to become a branch for a moment, for a season, for whatever it is, become a branch of its own, an individual being, individual mind that has a structure of the ego, then there is free will, and there is control. And there is shoulds and woulds because then individual my, mind plays the game of the world that it created around itself. Is it? Is it? Does it? Does it happen in your experience? Is this? Is that what you observe? It seems that way in the sense that um, for me, I wanted to just let go of the world, and what I meant by that was what of the thinking of the world. I, I didn't want any sense of limit or constraint. Um, I wanted to feel that freedom, but it wasn't like uh, a, a personal freedom. So it was like there came a choice point to, do I want freedom of the body or freedom of the mind? And and one was a pursuit and the other was, was something that was offered there. And, I wanted the kind of freedom that was not circumstance dependent, dependent on circumstances or situations. You know, I was inspired by Gandhi. Um, you know, he stood for a principle. They put him in jail. He enjoyed cooking and writing and being with the prisoners and loving, and he had peace. But but he was in a jail cell, seemingly in form. The body of Gandhi was in a jail cell. And that inspired me. I thought, now that's the kind of freedom I want. I don't want the kind of freedom that that it depended on money, mm. depended on mobility, depended on transportation. And there is no freedom dependent on money, anyways. Yeah, right. Because it's just a trick. You know, <laughs> right. we we think you know you have more more choices and more freedom, but if we can buy more things, but you know, or have control over things with money, but that's just another 
illusion and trick. So, so we discover uh, that there is a true free will, and I think the true free will is spirit or God or love is for us to be happy. That, that's when we're in our free will. And when we forget that for a moment, then it can seem to be that there's a human game that's, that's there for an option. But increasingly, that, that becomes less attractive. Uh, you know, it's, it's like if you can just enjoy everything in a state of acceptance, in a state of total acceptance, then you see there's no point in playing little and mm. no point in playing small, tiny anymore. And then it just falls away. It's not something you fight against or you have to conquer or anything. It just, it just ceases to be in your awareness. You know, you touched up on the, the, the God, let's, let's give it a name, the God, mm -hmm. unified consciousness, wants us to be happy. You know, I find that quite interesting too, to, to reflect on, because it seems like if there is non-discriminatory experience, it's not that pursuit of happiness matters, it's experience matters. Yes. Because if, we, if we're looking for happiness, then we're right there discriminating everything that God is giving to us. It's giving to us all of it to experience. Yes. The God is experiencing itself, herself, himself, through mm -hmm. individualized consciousness that, that manifests itself in the body-mind. But it doesn't want to experience just that. I cannot say does not want because it doesn't want is no desires of, of the same kind but it's words it it wants experience it's, it wants to get to know itself practically it wants to get get expansion of experience through individualized consciousness and kind of back in and and humans as as, as an individual consciousness we are looking for happiness because that's we discriminate and it's perceived to be obviously better be happy than unhappy. But even that is taking us away from what we are actually looking for, its ultimate freedom. Because in the freedom there is no discrimination of experience on, on to be happy or not. It's just to experience everything as is without labeling it in any way. Isn't it so? Yeah, I think we, we can reach this transcendent state of consciousness and mind and then it so goes beyond anything that we seem to know as a human being. And then when that vastness, if it, if it goes away for even for a, a time, then if there's any kind of attachment or any kind of clinging or holding, uh, then that's where the, the limit comes in. And it's not, God hasn't gone away, love hasn't gone away, nothing has gone, it's just, the mind is not aware of its vastness when it tries to cling and hold on to something, it, when it tries to be ignorant or be small, play, play tiny. So to me, the, the whole experience is to, is to be as open-hearted as one can possibly be. And it just radiates and extends. That's what God is, ever-extending love, ever-extending joy and happiness. And what we have in terms of the people that I live with we and the guidelines I've used is no people pleasing, no private thoughts, just meaning it's okay. Share whatever you're feeling. Share whatever's on your heart. You don't have to hide and protect anything because that's the only way that we limit awareness is by hiding and protecting, playing like a hide-and-seek, a, a yeah. game of deception. Exactly. And that's what I noticed, this, this iteration what causes this iteration is when you're in expansive state of consciousness, when you are united with God, it's not united because you're not separated, but you're aware of that you are all of it, mm -hmm. then what kicks you back into human experience is the fear. There's somewhere in the field the fear becomes stronger let's say on vibration level of you name it, I don't even know how to describe it and I wouldn't even ever try it, but it feels like the fear somehow arises and pulls 
you back towards individualized consciousness when you fully embodied, you feel limitation of your body and limitation of the body mind, and therefore your experience now is subjected to rules of the world in which there is war and there is sickness and there is money that we invented because we invented them in the first place. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we become subject of su or subject to suffering. Yeah. Right? We start yeah. suffering because the fear itself moved us towards the structures that reinforce suffering, right? Yeah. So we'll say as a human being, you know, it seems like you're not aware of, of fear. Some, a lot of it can be unconscious fear. Most people don't go through their whole day just completely aware of fear all the time. Um, they have other uh, emotions, even some pleasant and very uh, wonderful experiences. But if it's unconscious, we'll say that means it's just pushed out of awareness, it's, it's unwatched or it's hidden, then what joy we have, what a life we have in being transparent and being open and not hiding anything. That's to me is the excitement of relationship. That's the excitement of, of community. Let's be transparent. We have nothing to hide. Uh, hiding is only going to keep it, push it down out of awareness and, and keep the fear. But perhaps if we keep exposing and we just have a great allowance and to be very transparent, we'll finally discover that there really is nothing to fear at all. That that, that was just make-believe. It was just a fiction. That's right. And you know, this community is interesting too. Because when when you are aware that you are all of it, then you don't need another to interact with. Really. Yes. Yes. But you equally you equally don't need to separate yourself from another. Yes. That's right. a beautiful way of saying it. That's so beautiful. Because I think you just we just draw forth witnesses, but but we we are not obligated to those witnesses. Um, so much of human relationships, there's so much obligation, and and then there's guilt um, to try to please people, to try to live up to expectations. Can we be truly free and be truly honest and say, well, here's what I'm feeling now, or let it come up? And this way of living, I find, has integrity. It has honesty, and you still can be guided to make commitments. Uh, ultimately, to be who we are, to be the one, I think is is our ultimate commitment. Um, it's like commitments. Commitments are not decisions. When when you are fully expanded, when you 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 are living, some refer to in the heart, or you are in the state of unifying consciousness versus individualized consciousness, the commitment is not even strategy or decision because it's the right thing to do. It becomes a logical impulse of the universe because commitment is integrity. And universe has this interesting way of organization where it's all based on some sort of universal integrity. So whatever commitments are, it's just an impulse yes. of, of, of existing in integrity, isn't it yes, so? Yes, it is. I think it's a natural impulse. It's the, it's the natural impulse of, of, of spirit, and it's, it's always available to us. And so there's no need for us to compromise and to play some games or to try to avoid that. It's wonderful. That's, that's our free will. That's our happiness, too, is is living in that integrity. So I, I think that's, that, that means that we really have a purpose for everything in this world. We can't say that we don't have a purpose. We do. In a way, but, but how, how it seems to me is, you know, people, people says, uh, often say, oh, discover your meaning of life, discover the purpose. Well, life itself is the meaning. Life itself, experiencing life, is the purpose and the meaning, and there is yeah. no real on any of any magnitude other meaning to individual life. But people yeah. try to create it because it's scary to be in unimportant. It's very scary to be nobody. 
But that's where the freedom is in being complete nobody. You can play somebody. You can play to be somebody. <laughs> I play to be all the former all the time. I'm writing blogs and, and I have videos and I call myself executive coach because you see something in, in that world, right? But what fa fall away is the identification with any of it that this is so serious and that's the way it's actually is. No, it's not it actually is. It's how we projected the form to play right now because the form takes what how do I say that the world take forms. The world of imagined which we created and which we live in, it takes forms. It's not formless. Unified consciousness is feels formless because it's so simultaneous and vast that it feels formless because it's such an eagle view that it's how at least I remember it so I share from the memory of it mm -hmm. or when I get into the state. But other than that, anyways, nothing to say there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I see that though you're you're a communicator and you you have much to share and much to extend, and it's beautiful that you just allow whatever form to be used to be used. You by your extending that that clarity, that integrity, that love. That's how you keep it. You know, love is meant to be extended. It's not love, meant love to be is extending up. itself by default because this is the property of love, isn't it? Yes, it is. Love it's a property. Right. It's not something that you can turn on or turn off or do a little bit here. It's not a matter of degree. And so I think you might say that a lot of us have been called to be like light workers because we have so much love and light to share. We find each other. We draw each other as witnesses, not out of a sense of need, not out of a sense of want, to rejoice, to to see and recognize, like, oh, I recognize you, I recognize you. It's a recognition, you. I love it. It's a recognition. That, that's what it is. I, when I looked at you guys, at the videos that, that you, you created, you know, the talks that you do and, and the community that you are uh, creating, I would assume it's keep creating itself, right? I thought it's wonderful because when people come with the whole idea to live the life of mystics, even though we know that we are not always uh, mystics because the individualized consciousness kicks in uh, on its own accord, and I bet you guys have there a lot of ego. <laughs> yes, the, 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 the intention, the impulse is to live life of mystics, life of truth, life of authenticity is a tricky word here, but let, let's call it authenticity. So the, the truth, and um, what I loved, one of your talks you were sharing somewhere, you were saying, uh, I don't believe that CEO can be enlightened. And, and it, so I was laughing, you know what, the reason why I'm laughing, because I just remember at one of the fundraisers, I just had the same conversation with someone, someone who said, oh, conscious CEOs and enlightened, we need to build mm -hmm. the world of uh, co commerce with CEOs are enlightened. And you're listening and say, it's just uh, impossibility of it. That's what, what mm -hmm. obvious impossibility. Yeah. The, the world of commerce, operates in so many different structures and it's fully based on you identifying with your role in the world, with the world, yes. the world of war. Yes. There is no, it's impossible to run organization of thousands of people that, that whose sole um, purpose of it is profit and profit connected with all the human emotion, greed and fears and, and uh, separation and, and now we start talking about personal brands and we keep creating us away from unified consciousness. We keep, we keep like painters, we keep painting ourselves away <laughs> from unified consciousness. <laughs> yeah, and right? it's silly because when we see that we laugh. We laugh at the question, you know, when they say, can I, can I keep painting and be a unified consciousness? And we say, no, that's painting away from it. Just come back and, and let the unified awareness express. And if it involves painting, then you're not going to be trying to sell it or make a commodity out of it. There's not going to be a possession. 
of it because the vast awareness doesn't possess anything. Yeah, true, so true. How first experience happened to David? Your first experience of awakening, was it result of the practice and was it course of miracle that you had at that point as your discipline or course of miracle that you're teaching so much right now came as a, your, a idea, your desire to explain your experience? It okay. actually came, the, the course came as a, as a helpful tool um, for me to give, give myself over completely. And then there was one point where I was with a woman and we'd, we'd gone off um, into the woods and um, we decided to take some chairs and a table and just sit out in the woods and do like an open-eyed meditation, um, just gazing at one another. And then the figure ground, the, the, the depth perception, the three-dimensionality just collapsed. And then all this bright light started coming right around where her head was and, and the trees in the background. And then the whole world disappeared. So and then I was, you brought it through tantric, through tantric practice. It, well, it was so much. I was so relaxed and so still. And my eyes were open. I wasn't trying to follow a, a technique. I just got so still and so relaxed and, and the recognition was so strong that it, the light just burst through the form and then there was only light. And then another time I went out with her, we were out in a, a, a rowboat in the water and the breeze was blowing us along. We weren't even using the oars. We were sitting facing each other again the same way and in just the very stillness and then the same thing happened. And then it happened the third time uh, when we were in a kitchen and just sitting across the kitchen table. But th so the world, when the whole world disappears and it's just all love and light, then you you know exactly what what's real. So like she was the catalyst for you in a way, right? She was very helpful. She was. We were both there, relaxing into it together, and and I think that was very much a part of it. You know, because. Because we were just relaxing into the same experience. We weren't, there was no it, They were in love. Some would call it that. We, it, yeah. So in love that the world disappeared. Exactly, <laughs> that's, exactly. That's the way it went, yeah. It's interesting. And, and prior to that, did you practice anything? Well, okay, so here's a question. Were you seeking enlightenment? Or it just spontaneously happened? I think it was for me just peace of mind and, and feeling really warmed up in my heart and feeling really connected. I don't think at the beginning I I called it enlightenment or I I, I didn't really want to think of it as a pursuit, um, to pursue something like you pursue, humans pursue many things. I didn't want that. I just, I wanted to relax into an experience and then I wanted that experience to be stable and consistent. Not and at this point, a course of miracle came uh, to your life? Yeah, it, it was 1986. I went out to uh, California, where you are now, except I was in Southern California, in La Jolla, down more towards San Diego. And I went to a humanistic psychology conference. Mm -hmm. And there were people like uh, Carl Rogers, uh, who was speaking. It was his last time that he spoke on Earth. Um, at that conference, and Virginia Satir, transpersonal psychologists, humanistic psychologists, and then I, I went and I met these two people who had this book, A Course in Miracles, and their teacher was on a videotape, Tara Singh, and it was I felt such a draw and a connection, so I kept canceling workshops and things I was supposed to go to, you know how it is, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. I said I'll cancel. Okay, today I cancel some more. I just went with it, and that's how I got introduced to it. And then, when I I had I was in a relationship at the time with a Christian woman, but when I started to give myself over to this experience, I saw that it was beyond Christianity. It was beyond theology, and even the course says, you know, that that a universal uh, theology is impossible, but a universal experience is inevitable. And I, I said, yes, I, I feel that. So it was just a tool that I used, but that's how it came into my life. It kind of dropped into my lap. But after you had the experience of, of expanded consciousness, right? 
I had some glimmers of expanded consciousness, and then the course came, and it was almost like, oh, I've got no excuses. I just have to give myself over to what seemed to be a practice, but then deep enough where the, the practice disappeared. Like people ask me, what does your spiritual practice look like? And I, I laugh. I say, I don't, I don't have one. <laughs> Beingness you know, is has taken over. The whole, your life is, is a practice. Yes. And it's interesting. It sounds like one does not need practice, but, but it's true and not true at the same time because you 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 need practice till you get it. Yes, exactly. And when you get it now you don't need practice. That's exactly. That's exactly right. it. So that's why I don't try to tell people, you know, that it has to be a certain way or look a certain way because I think all of us find practice and discipline is very, very helpful and necessary until it's not. And exactly. then, when it's, then it's like, okay. Exactly. And then the very funny sometimes argument uh, around the practice, my religion versus your religion, my type of yoga versus your type of yoga, and now let's prote protect yoga and let's, let's, let's patent it and call it transcendental meditation. Let's, I mean, all this interesting wars of, of, of teaching, wars of knowledge, which is, it's not about the practice itself. It's not one better than another. It's what takes you there, and sometimes nothing. Sometimes yes. even nothing. When I looked at what happened to me, it was the most ridiculous thing ever. I was a pretty happy child, and I went through my different experiences, and I had a very traumatic experiences. I was almost killed, raped, robbed, betrayed. I mean, like a human being, I experienced everything I could in a pretty short period of time. And then there was time when you start to have sense this world is just too small. The world of the mind, the world created by the mind to which we subject ourselves, there is, that's not why I belong. And it's not that I was depressed, I was not depressed. But there was this sense of there is something else I, I needed to know, something else I needed to see, and it became such a strong longing. It was unbearable longing to know something that I don't know, see something that I don't see. And it was became so unbearable that I remember one day I stay in the shower on the water and I start and bang at the wall, say, fuck, sorry, if you're less than 16, don't watch it. Fuck, <laughs> show, show me, I cannot stand it any longer. God, no God, I don't care, show me or kill me. <laughs> and I was yelling, that was the Lord, and I was just yelling like that, like crazy person. Next day, I went to, you know, sometimes you entertain yourself, so I went to, um, we call it ecstatic dance, and there is the mu music, you know, people, drums, yes. playing drums. And I came there early, and I sit down in the corner, and musicians just, they were just, just uh, fixing the stuff and just preparing to the show. And I sit, and I just close my eyes for a moment, and that was it. And that was it. I disappeared. My body disappeared. My mind and perception and ego disappeared, and everything revealed itself in the glimpse of time as this beautiful dance created by the mind. There was no time, there was nobody in there, and everything suddenly became clear. There was no questions. There was no more questions. And the answers not need to be found because the questions transcended. There was no more question, yes. nothing to yes. seek, nothing yes. to find, nothing to find. And it lasted to me about 22 hours or something. It was the most bizarre experience at that point. It felt bizarre because yeah. you cannot comprehend by the mind unless you taste the orange. You cannot explain the orange. So I love right. when people talk about spirituality and they use all those concepts and they try to explain it and it's pointless. Yes. The word yes. only can point to it. They never can translate it into it, right? Uh, yes. and, and and the experience was magnificent at the same time very disappointing. For the ego, for the human Olga, it was disappointing because the longing was so tremendous. It was almost just I don't want to leave. It's not that I was suicidal. It just unless I know I don't want to leave. And then when it reveals itself, it's yes. magnificent, yet it's so simple. Somehow it felt but it's just too simple. <laughs> hey, my mind is I'm very analytical. Give me something complicated. <laughs> Give me some complicated uh, things that I still need to comprehend. But there is nothing to comprehend any longer. Yeah. 
it fell away, questions, just everything fell away. And I was really disappointed. For a month, I was pouting, you know, so it's like, <laughs> I don't want that environment thing. <laughs> That's just not good enough. <laughs> You're describing it so beautifully that you in the shower wanting it with all your heart and soul and mind and might and then having the experience and then then the ego it will pout, it will say, What way, whoa, wait a minute that I I <laughs> because the ego is afraid of love. And that's why we have to let go of the ego, because we are love. We can't be afraid of ourselves. We can't be afraid of spirit and God. We're, we're created by spirit, you know, as spirit. So it's so delightful to hear that, because it's, it's very comical, actually. But the questions all leave, and, 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 and you don't even, you can't even describe it. Like you said, it's, it, the words just point to it. And I think that's the greatest thing that I've had in my life is I don't feel a need to have to explain it or describe. I can just go along and be so, so, so content until I get an email from a woman named Olga and <laughs> and then I I immediately connect with you and it's just was the spirit does it through us. It's mm -hmm. so easy, it's so natural. It's like you said, it's not really, this isn't an interview. This is, we are the presence of love, and this is just a form that it's expressing. In, but it comes so easy and natural. There's not a sense of you don't know, try to go seek something or make something happen at all. It's so easy. Yes, it is. Tell me, did you experience... I really want to, to you to share about your life a little bit more because I, I was listening your your videos and a lot of people who listen this conversation they might not done it so far but I invite you to do it. Um, you share that at first you as you were letting go of the world you I, I assume pursued um, homeless life. You didn't know when next meal comes, where next uh, a roof comes, yes. when you will sleep, what you will eat, what will happen, you did not in five years or something like that. It's, yes. Eckhart Tolle shares uh, the same uh, way that he just sit on the bench and that's just it till things started to happen, you know, people invite you to speak because they hear you and somehow they, they cover the cost of your living and that and another as long as you trust. Of course, uh, there's so many questions for people who who listen like I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to let go. I have this house, million dollar in California here. Really, there's million dollar house, and I have a wife and kids, and they're going to Harvard or Stanford. And then, I mean, you ha I have my life organized, and I have yeah. strategies for the next ten years. And if you ask me my goal in five years, I will tell you because it's elevator pitch, <laughs> yeah. and so on, so forth. So it requires great bravery for the ego to let go of what it's holding on to. And it's very interesting because its ego makes the decision to let go despite its purpose purpose to get you embodied almost. That's how I see that. Which is that's why I find very interesting. To me it did not happen, David, and that's why we might have this conversation because I have this huge when I'm not unified consciousness, when I'm Olga and, and believe myself to be <laughs> despite knowing that I'm not. It's I I cannot get to the point where I can fully let go and trust, and so I, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to talk to you because in you that trust happened, and I still when I am Olga, I'm conflicted about the fact that I am living in this world created by the mind, and my mind is pretty pretty strong mind, and it's created by <laughs> structures, and this then it holds on to structures, so it requires iterations all the time, which sometimes can be exhausting because you really need to kick yourself out of, of individualized consciousness into unified to relax and rest. Because the life, the struggle in the world, because it's always kind of struggle, you, it's always the, the act of will, it's always the act of effort, it's always the moment of control. So, so this game is extremely tiring, it's very tiring, draining so much energy, right? Yes. So how did it happen to you that, that there was this moment of complete let go and complete trust? Do you remember anything about it to share? I, I felt inspired 
before the moment of really complete trust, I, I was moved in the direction of that. Like it was almost like the spirit was saying, come closer. I'll give you more experiences and here some more and some more and more. So you start to gain a confidence in the trust, not a blind trust, but I need experience and oh, here's another one. And then another one. Uh, for example, I was told I was I was impelled to start traveling, and I was David was not a traveler. Uh, even going as a child with to, with my parents on long vacations, I didn't like to be in a car for eight, ten, twelve hours, uh, and just sitting in a car. I, I I didn't really enjoy travel as a child, but something in this moment of big trust came. It was a purpose for the travel. I wasn't just going around the body, moving around. It was something much greater than that. And it was all about the trust. Like the spirit was like saying, I will take care of you. I will show you. I will give you everything that you need. Sometimes we, we use the word uh, divine providence. Uh, life takes care. But sometimes we think of Mother Teresa or St. Francis or somebody like that as if Spirit takes care of that person. Oh, Spirit took care of St. Francis, and Spirit takes care of Mother Teresa, and we think Spirit doesn't take care of other people. Like They have to go have jobs and careers and earn lots of money and do it all themselves. No, but St. Francis, you know, we say, oh, yeah, he could sit with the birds and be out with the flowers and not have a career because he was St. Francis, you know. What I find is it, divine providence is, is for all of us. It's like when we believe that we have to earn our life, earn it, then we have a belief, and that's what the ego is. We have to earn everything. I'm not saying that, that hard work is, is bad. I'm saying that when you relax and you get inspired, then what comes through you is your life's work. But it's just given to you moment by moment. You don't have to figure it out, or you don't have to have a resume for it, or you know, package it in some way and try to sell it to somebody. So that's what those five years were about for me. They were, I, I was impelled to travel. And then I thought, how, how will I travel? And I had enough money to go get a, a small car. And then when I traveled, people would take me in or offer me food or say, well, you want some gas money? Very different from my life. I wasn't living like that ever before, but I, I was willing. And then I still had pride. <laughs> Willingness came from. This is what I would I would I really 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 want Olga. Olga wants to understand. When unified, <laughs> unified consciousness, she doesn't care. There is birds and flowers and life is pretty <laughs> and and she can just live uh, outdoor and everything is fantastic. But the iteration happened and then Olga comes to play. Say, wait a minute. I got all my education and uh, by the next uh, year I'm supposed to make seven million. So, no, I'm not going to let go because I'm still on the way to get all those toys. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still need to buy, the, buy karma. I want that karma car, electric. Uh, so, you know, all this, all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, the stuff, the stuff, yeah, right? The stuff. Yeah. And then, and then you know, you sit here and, sit, and it just, it's just so amazing that all you can do is laugh because there is somewhere in the middle there is opportunity to actually let go of everything. But there is this play between, oh, I don't need anything, and everything is perfect and wonderful, and here, but there is an Olga, there's Olga, and Olga is married, and she needs to take care of her marriage, and she needs to take care of, of her clients, she needs to take care of uh, her parents, and all, all, all that, you know, what, everybody yeah. has their own notions, what their responsibilities are, and desires are, and fears are, right? Yeah. But, but do you remember the moment where you just, just felt, I'm willing, I'm willing to let go of the world? Was it like... Something like I just had enough of it, enough of the game. It's just enough. It's not entertaining enough. Or what was that moment where just? <sighs> yeah, that to me that moment it was a huge moment of trust. Like I thought, nothing that I've tried as a person has worked, uh, and and I tried many things. And so I just said, why not just let go and really go for it? I mean, fully, just pour myself into it. It's like the spirit was like saying to me, very good, that's just what I want. I want you to trust me completely and I'll show you. Oh, you won't be sorry at all. 
you well enough, so then you go, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so you know everything, and then you have no choice. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I I had to say I don't know, but I trust you. I don't know, but show me. I I don't. All my education, every experience I've had in the world hasn't got me free. I haven't experienced my free will from all of that. So I'm willing to try this. And then show me, convince me, and everything. And then the spirit did. It, I was so ex, 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 just ecstatic. I was so convinced with it that that there wasn't a sense of of a David to be concerned about. Uh, it, it's like there couldn't be a, a famous David or an infamous David. There couldn't be a good David or a bad David. I could just sit with somebody who was yelling at me just as easy as somebody who was smiling at me. And and not be affected because it's because I don't believe there's a David to be offended. You know, I'm not identified with the David character. And then from this wonderful, wonderful experience, I would do anything to give it. I can only give it. There's there's no other option but to give it. And therefore, when when those have come to join with me, they say, I want to join with you. We have an awareness that this is for the whole universe. This isn't a me and you experience. We're not trying to gain something or become known or famous or uh, figure something out or anything like that. It's just simple, very, very, very simple experience. So for those that have come and say, "I want to join you," and they and I can feel it, the spirit, you know, knows it. Then it's just we. We are going to live an experience of this joy and love and happiness, and we're not going to give any belief to anything else. And that shows us that it's it's all our mind, our experience. You know, it's not we are not at the mercy of the world, not at all. Yeah, and and how did David deal with first years of this journey uh, when he let go of control, let go of his ideas about his part of the world, in the world, and wandered around. How did he deal with adversity? Because probably not every day you had place to live or comfortable place to live. And not every day uh, you had any sort of security. And maybe you were robbed and maybe you were beaten up by strangers. I really don't know what was happening. So I wouldn't I want to hear uh, about it because maybe you were sleeping outside and they were raining and wet and dirty and cold. I mean, I don't know. The, David is a body. How did he deal with the transition? Well, it actually was, I have to say, it was quite easy in the sense that I think I told you that I spent like two and a half years with the course, immersing with it, like very deeply and intimately, and then then Jesus was speaking to me. And when Jesus tells you where to go, when to turn, turn off, call so-and-so, do this, do that, it was I talked about like having a little bird, a little Jesus bird on my shoulder that was talk, talk, talk to me, not just I love you and all those kind of things that you think maybe Jesus would say, but turn here, do this, do this, very specific. So it would be almost like um, you might have seen the movie like S Star Wars. Uh, there was a Star Wars episode with Luke. Uh, Luke Skywalker had to go into the big Death Star. And he had to go not just into the Death Star, but he had to go into the middle of it and take out the power, knock out the power. And as he got closer to the core, he was flying his uh, spaceship his ship there, and then Obi-Wan Kenobi comes into his mind. Use the force. Like, close your eyes. No, don't don't try to do it yourself, Luke. Use the force. Use the force. So when I before I started traveling, I had a connection with my source, with intuition, with Jesus, and I was a very willing follower. So I wouldn't wake up in the day wondering what I was going to do, I, I knew I would be listening and following. And Jesus would say, go to this course group. And there would be objections sometimes from the ego. Like one time I was driving along in uh, Oklahoma and I had a, 
a, a, a list of all these Course in Miracles groups and it was like a Sunday morning and I looked at my list and I'm driving and Jesus is saying go go to this group and I looked at it and it was close by but I said wait a minute the group's almost over I said oh no the group is is only 10 minutes left in the group and he said go to the group I said, with only 10 minutes left, you want me to walk into a, a Course in Miracles group with 10 minutes left? He said, yes. Okay, I mean, I will follow. I, I, don't, I don't know my own best interest. I, I will just follow. So I go to the group. They're having a big discussion on sexuality. Big, big dis heated discussion on sexuality. They, they're so heated, they don't even see me. I'm just walking and just sitting there. And then they look and they go, oh, when did when did you come? And I said, oh, just just a little while ago. And they said we don't usually talk about sex every week. Uh, where they were a little embarrassed and so on and so forth. And then one of them said, I'll come out to lunch with us. And then I'll come to my condominium. And then oh, I have to go do some things. Why don't you play tennis? Use the jacuzzi? I never met the people. But the kind of trust it was like the miracles were being led by the the intuition, where to go, what to do, who to meet, and amazing, miraculous experiences would open up. So it wasn't so much David hoping that I could find a way, facing all these adverse, I, there were still times when, when I would seem adverse to the ego, like something, somebody wanting to throw my body down, or you know, even some extremes, but I got so into the guidance and so into the flow and my confidence grew so strong by listening, following, listening, following, listening, following, that I started to feel like I was invulnerable, like, like I was fearless, like really fearless, like mm. nothing could harm me. Mm. And that was the most magnificent feeling because then I would relax be very, I felt like I was so cared for. And there's even a part in A Course in Miracles uh, that says, talks about the Spirit. He will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on, mm -hmm. no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. Mm -hmm. difficulty melt away before you reach it and I was just like okay yes yes I'm going for this because I know with a lot of non-dual teachings we we will share about this experience but the words you know they never they never capture it mm -hmm. but what I found is when we join together in experiencing the guidance and the miracles we we help each other when we have a burning passion for it we actually help each other we go faster together when we want the same thing and that's where i think with human beings it's such it's so frustrating because with a lot of their relationships they feel very obligated they feel that people say give me give me yeah I need, I want. The world is very imprisoning. Transactional world gets yes. us into thinking that life is transactional. And even, you know, I don't know, David, how you see it, but I find every relationship a transactional. Yeah. Every single relationship a transactional. You cannot say that there are altruistic relationships. It's always give and take, always give and take. Some things are obvious and some are very subtle. Some, some people would argue, no, no, no. I don't need anything, I am given just, but no, as a human, as long as you are identified with yourself as I, you always given to get something, either a recognition, or just gratitude from someone, or your emotion, oh, I just gave, or whatever, whatever it is, it's always transactional, and it's, as, as a human, it experience, experiences it, it's frustrating. Yes, yes. The feeling that the heart is always subject to closing, 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 even though you want to give and then in closing because it, 
interactions come to get transactional. Yeah, and and once you see that, then, and we know there has to be an, another way. There has to be more than that. Okay. For me, my whole life has been an experiment in that. In other words, I started traveling around and going and being taken in and invited for talks and everything, and um, it was just me showing up and I never knew what would happen or what I would say, but I did have an expectation of like um, being taken care of. If somebody said stay, I could stay, or if they said go, I could go. And what I wanted to discover was how can I learn to be truly generous? I mean, not transactional, but truly generous. So when I had this experience of trust, that's when I would just travel and I would accept things, but I wouldn't ask for them. I would just accept them if they were given. Um, as Jesus told me, eat whatever served, whatever served. I said, what, what are you saying? And, you know, because I know I'd done vegetarianism, I'd done different disciplines of eating, but whatever is served, and just accept, he said, with love. Just see it's a gift. Don't judge it and don't push it away. Just accept, eat whatever serve. Sleep wherever you're, you're offered a place to sleep. Don't be trying to tell the world and tell people what you want. Just accept, accept. So I had to get into the rhythm of, of that. And then I found when I finally started doing the things like you're doing, these Google Hangouts and blogs and different things, I started to feel so wonderful about sharing and extending, so I'd make websites and put stuff up, and and I really enjoyed giving lots and lots and lots of free materials away, trusting that if I was to continue in that way, then donations would come to make websites or the servers or whatever you need, email and this and this. But there's still expectation, isn't it? There's still expectation, though. Well, it's this not. The thing was, I, I was had so much love to give that I, I didn't really care whether it would continue in a certain form or not. I was just having so much fun. I was like flinging my seeds all over the place, and people like that. They like the the generosity of that because what we are joining in is we're we're joining in. There has to be more than this transactional world. We we okay. know it in our heart. We just know it. So. Everyone that I meet, I really feel is my opportunity to to go into that. In other words, if we had never met and we were on an island, we came together, this would be the most important thing to, to experience this because it's our truth. It's our reality. And then you get into day-to-day -day thing, a day-to-day -day practice with it. So I, I find I love being a giver. But not a giver with expectations. I, to me, that that's just transaction. You know, give and get, give and get, give and get. You know, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. I'll scratch your back. If you, I'm not even interested in that. Even collaborations I do, I will come together, and when some somebody says, let's just do it. We agree to do it. We don't have contracts. We don't write out all kinds of if this and this and this and this. Not interested. I trust. You know, I feel the connection. I go for it. That's enough for me. So it's it's exciting that we have this opportunity to to practice giving. You know, truly giving from our hearts. I find the journey that you describe is, is beautiful, fascinating, and as a human, as the old, guy, I'm almost a bit jealous that you was able to to let go of that rock on the cliff. And rock. I, you know the rock, the cliff, hanging, yes. there, just hanging yes, the yes. Head, or the branch is hanging. Yes, you know? yes, yes, yes. Because we assume that something is holding on, uh, holding us, but we are holding on. There is nothing holding yes. us, holding on. For right. me, for example, it's just a mer matter of decision. And for and I know that my mind is very tricky. It's like, Olga, when you become sixty or seventy, then you can venture on the journey because then you are not going to be young semi-pretty blonde girl that every man tried to get in your pants in. So if you journey in alone, expecting food and, and the roof come whenever it comes, you have to be ready for adversity because there will be a lot of abuse and pain. Yeah, that's the conditioning. That's that's what the storyline maybe showed. Like you said, 
you go through the human experience and you have these memories and then that's where time comes in. Then you think, aha, that's what could happen in the future. So I better take care of myself. I need a career. I need to do right. this. I mean, even with clients, I wanted to be able to shine and write emails and this and this, but without having clients because, you know, what if I was having a very deep experience and I didn't want to answer emails? Um, so I would ask Jesus and he would say, don't, don't do anything out of fear. Don't do anything out of obligation. Don't do anything out of duty. I have to, I must, I should. Live from joy. Live from inspiration. Let inspiration be your motive. And I thought, is this possible? I, I can in, On this planet, can you actually do that? And he said, yes. He'd, he said he'd done it himself. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, this has already been done. You're not doing something new. You're just showing, you're just experiencing what he knew was already true. So I had a lot of discussions with Jesus. I'd say, listen, G- Jesus, money doesn't grow on trees. I can't just go out to my backyard and start picking $100 bills just to see what he would say to me. And he said, yeah, I know you believe that. You believe that. And he said, but I'll show you. Just trust me. I'll show you. Trust and show. Trust and show. So now I like to give it away. That's why I put up my YouTubes or whatever, and I'll talk with my groups, and they'll say, well, what do you think? should we monetize uh, the YouTubes, you know, with uh, with ads and get some money off of everyone? And, and they'll all sit around for a while and they go, no, we don't want you to do that. Well, what about your speakers, you know, where you do your audio thing? Should we monetize it? No. They, I've drawn forth witnesses all around me where they wouldn't want that. They, they're reflections of trust too. Their reflections of now. Let's not turn this into a career. Uh, let's just keep it simple and pure and giving and giving and giving and trust and trust and trust. And besides, who would you want to spend your life with except those beings that are reflections of your own trust? That trust that even if you're having a bad day or somebody's going through some stuff that you're held. That people come to you and say, oh, can I help you? And and they just, instead of trying to explain yourself or f- figure it out or whatever, you're just held. You know, that's what we all wanted. That's what I wanted when I was growing up. I I had a dog that was pretty, pretty good at loving me unconditionally, but that's all I wanted was relationships where I was loved and accepted. And now I want to give it. You know, now I see the value of it, so I want to give it away with everyone that I meet. How do you find people in community when they join in? Do you find they bring the old consciousness, the, the, the individual consciousness, or they, they step into life of mystics easy? Well, some... Do you leave that together? So, so obviously, yeah. why you try to step out, uh, out of the monetary world that is yes. so limiting and... and, and contractual and transactional into this way of being with full trust and um, willingness to meet adversity if that's what is they have what they has to offer really right yeah well I'd say in the early days of community um, yeah the people that came in they were they were willing but they had a lot of undoing to go through they found it um, they found it difficult. Um, there was part of their mind that thought, I want to live a life of devotion and happiness. And then when the ego reared up, they went, oh, this is dark. This is very, very dark. And and some said, no, I can't do it. Some hung in there for a while and then said, no, I, it, I, I can't. I have to go back to the world. I, I, can't, I can't handle this. Uh, more recently, we have like indigo children uh, and crystal children that are showing up, you know, 18, 19, 22, 26, 30, they don't come with a lot of baggage. They, the level of conditioning is different. Yes, they, they don't fit in. 
into American dream or, right. or anything else similar to that. Because the propaganda on American dream and everything surrounding all the concept, concept, men, mental concept that, that surrounded this dream, were pro the propaganda was so strong, there was so much money spent on making the, the thought real and actually stick in the mind, right? They are now, they're witnessing the, how in, in not feasible the promise is, how, how much suffering it brought to those who bore into that. So they are not as conditioned, there are other conditioning of course can happen there, but be, because it seems like all this societal and economical structure right now, are they so, it's, it's so easy to see how, con, how much conflict they, they represent. Yes. They are a little bit more free. I think they are more free because there is more confusion. So that it's yeah. easy not to buy in. When there is a confusion, it's easy not to buy in into the idea. But the the other generation bought into very clean cut of American dream. It was the the picture was perfect, <laughs> wasn't it? Yes. Right? Yes, it's very much that. And now I find that that the spirit sends those towards the community that have much to offer because they they didn't buy into it. And they don't have much ego to deal with. They, they're they very sincere and they're, they're very trusting and they still go through uh, some healing and some some intensity, but, but it's very different now. I find that as I've just continued giving and giving and giving in a very pure way, I am not trying to recruit anybody. I'm not trying to grow anything in size. I, I, I don't even believe, I think really we're all in community. I, I feel I'm in community with all seven billion, you know, because it's all, it's all our mind, it's all our consciousness. How can I not be in community with anyone? But in, in terms of people who actually come to be around me or whatever, I find more and more they come in there lighter and lighter. And the ones that, that feel a heaviness, they feel it's a sacrifice or something, then they, they just go. You know, they they say I'm not ready for this. They said I, I love you, and I'm grateful, I'm happy, but I I'm just not ready. And then they go. So I I don't even have to give it a thought. You know, the the ones that hover around that that feel, oh my gosh, this is so great. Every day they're just so pinch me. Oh my gosh, this is the most wonderful thing. They are the ones that stay, and then the others seem to drift away. Mm -hmm. So beautiful, David, so beautiful. Look, I so look forward to visit you guys in the summer as we discussed. Yes, yes. I'm so grateful for this for this new friendship that somehow happened in the universe and it was dropped on our heads. Um, you are love and, and I want to extend more love into your space and for you to share with all your community. And I will definitely come and visit you guys. Uh -huh. and Whatever will be happening. Uh, that's so great. Well, when you send me the link to this, I'll I'll let them know and they'll play it. And they're they're all just going to fall in love with you. So you'll come and visit and and have a bunch of people that are just falling in love with you because that's you you know you just just extend it so naturally and it's just so felt. So it's very very wonderful and I'm very grateful for this too. However it. The Spirit did this. I'm very, very grateful for it. So much gratitude for your time, David. So much love. And made the day unfold something phenomenal in your space. And I will reconnect okay. with you very soon. Okay, very good. Thank you, Olga. I love you. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> much love.